In a moment, I'm going to welcome our guests, uh, Jay Jordan and Issa Fromo, and I'm going to also uh, welcome uh, the co-editor of this wonderful book that they'll pre be presenting today, We Are Nature Defending Itself, Mark Herbst. But before we jump into that, I would like to welcome um, someone who works with us at the Reimagining Value Action Lab, the uh, Rivals uh, Graduate Research, uh, uh, um, what's the technical term we use? A graduate researcher uh, who, who we work with, uh, Tina Monroe, who unfortunately cannot join us as a panelist and cannot be seen. And so as a disembodied voice is going to uh, give us a, a land acknowledgement to begin our event. Tina. Hi, everyone. Bienvenue at Twist. Um, as Max was saying, my name is Tina Monroe. I'm a graduate student and graduate research fellow at RIVAL, <laughs> Imagining Value Action Lab at Lincoln University. Um, so because Lincoln University is located on Anishinaabe territory, um, trying to acknowledge the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. The Aridlia campus is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. That includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, the Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. So today we're joining in this meeting over Zoom, which is a cyber world that takes place beyond our bodies, beyond geography. So I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the relationships that we share wherever we are on this planet today with the land, each other, and most importantly, with ourselves as land. And as Jay and Issa mentioned so beautifully in their work, when we realize that you can become the territory, freedom no longer floats in the air, but lives in the relationships and the ties of need and desire that you build. So with that, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tina. And and sorry for forgetting the title. And sorry <laughs> also that you're a, you're a disembodied voice this time because of technical issues. And we'll hear more from Tina after the presentation as well. All right, well, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event, uh, which has been a long time coming and a real celebration of a truly wonderful book that Jay and Issa have, have penned, We Are Nature Defending Itself, Entangling Art, uh, Activism and Autonomous Zones, which, came, which is now released fully to the worldwide public via uh, Pluto Press. Uh, it's been released under the Vagabonds uh, imprint, which is a imprint that I edit uh, for Pluto Press, it's the third um, book in our series. We have two more coming out next year. I'd like to encourage everyone to go and check out uh, the series and this title in particular at uh, http colon slash slash vagabonds.xyz. Uh, Vagabonds are short pamphlets to fan the flames of discontent at the intersection of art, activism, and scholarly inquiry. And they are peer reviewed. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, Beverly Nadus, who's here in the Zoom room, who was one of the reviewers for this wonderful book and gave fabulous feedback uh, that really helped uh, bring this book along. And I also want to extend a huge thank you to uh, Mark Herbst of the Journal of Aesthetics and Protest, who is the other editor of this book. We, we partnered together, uh, Vagabonds and uh, the Journal of Aesthetics and Protest, to bring this out. And it's it's been a long-term project of Mark's to bring this uh, to the world. And so I'd like to ask Mark to say a quick word about the book and its origins, and then to introduce our wonderful authors, Jay and Issa, to give a presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Max, for that. And of course, uh, thank you so much, Jay and Issa, for the honor of uh, working with you on this book, which, um, as uh, Max mentioned, is a long time coming, a project that I fell in love with um, and uh, started as a long collective story of editing um, and collaborating with um, Max and then uh, a variety of other collaborators and contributors, which can be read about in the first book, which I won't get into. Um, I'd rather just enjoy this moment of celebration and uh, read the forward, uh, read uh, the bios for Jay and Issa, and then um, uh, and, uh, the intro to, or the, um, bio of the lab for which they are part of. Um, so, Isabel Frommel, also known as Issa, uh, reading from the book, um, is an educator and action researcher. She was formerly senior lecturer in media and cultural studies at Birkbeck College in London. Jay Jordan is an activist and author, a co-founder of Reclaim the Streets and the Clandestine 
clandestine insurgent clown army. Together, they co-facilitate the laboratory of insurrectionary, insurrectionary imagination. Uh, and about the laboratory for insurrectionary imagination, from their website, uh, labo.zone, uh, there isn't a, this isn't a normal traveling theater company, you know, that's what Scotland Yard said about them in 2004. Uh, but from their words on that website, uh, the laboratory brings together cultural workers and activists to co-design co and carry out creative forms of, of direct action, which attempt to be as joyful as they are politically active. They train people in entangling resistance and creativity in building resilient horizontal forms of organizing. They call, our, they call their work experiments because they believe courage and creativity are fed when one claims the right to fail. And they believe that the role of art in this era of the capitalist scene is not to show the, show the world to people, but to transform it together. So uh, with that, I am very excited to tell them to take it away. <laughs> Congratulations, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark and uh, and Max, and thank you, and Tina. Thank you very much for this beautiful land acknowledgement. Um, we want to um, thank very much uh, Mark for his incredible patience and resilience and enthusiasm for the for the project, and uh, and Max for his uh, enthusiasm and and support. Um, it's uh, it's very nice to do it from uh, from here where we're back home after a, a gorgeous and very intense uh, tour presenting this uh, this pamphlet um, in the UK and um, and so we're delighted to uh, to speak from um, our yurt here um, that is pretty much where the the control tower of an in international airport um, could have stood and this is what we're going to tell you about um, this is a this is a book about we hope um, about victory and hope and we feel that um, stories of hope are, are very much necessary um, at the moment um, this book um, indeed took a long time coming in years in fact and that's mostly because we tend to prioritize action over words and uh, and the writing was put on hold many times um, to put our lives and our bodies in the way of the building of an infernal piece of life wrecking um, infrastructure that is an international airport that was planned for the wetlands on which uh, on which we we are and uh, and as our one of our great ancestors of land occupation and squatting and radical commoning and pamphlet writing win stanley wrote over 300 years ago words and writings were all nothing and must die for action is the life of all and we feel that it's really important to uh, to have that in mind uh, today um, the title of this pamphlet we are nature defending itself is even older than the start of the of the writing and we actually first saw it um, in the midst of an action back in 2012 um, and it was tattooed on the forearm of a comrade in a in a muddy tear gas field forest uh, just next uh, to here and she was basically throwing uh, tear gas canisters back at the cops when the french government thought that they could just come with their troops and and build their airport and this is what we're going to tell you um, about tonight how they could not um we uh, we also first used the the slogan for an experiment that we co-facilitated in, in 2015 with our collective, the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. And basically the, the pamphlet tells our story, our very personal version um, of the, the story of the lab and our journey to try to really truly entangle art activism and everyday life. And so I'm gonna uh, do a bit where we talk about, you know, how we got to the ZAD, how we got here. Uh, and a bit about the lab, just to give a bit of context about uh, the laboratory of insurrection imagination. And then Isa will uh, end with uh, the story of the, the ZAD, uh, which is the heart of the pamphlet. So what do we do in the lab? Mark explained it a bit, but basically we bring artists and activists together to create new forms of disobedience. Basically, the idea is to design and then to deploy new forms of disobedience. 
keyword being deploy. There are a lot of artists who do a lot of designing of forms of disobedience, which often stay in the museums and the galleries and the theatres. Uh, and for us, the, uh, the key is actually to deploy these things. So why do we bring artists and activists together? Uh, basically, we believe that artists, and this is obviously a huge generalisation, but that artists have a certain amount of creativity, a way of thinking outside of the box. Um, they uh, also can really bring the poetic or the metaphorical to things, but they also tend to have pretty big egos, tend to put their career in front of their politics, tend to have a, a lack of coherence between their political uh, ideas and their ways of life, um, and not much courage sometimes. But what do activists have? Well, we think activists, and this is also a generalization, have a lot more courage, um, have normally a capacity to work uh, collectively a bit better, uh, normally have less big egos, although that's not always the case, uh, but definitely uh, put have less space between their ways of life and their ideas. Uh, and unfortunately, have a lack of imagination quite often. Uh, often it's the same toolbox of, of rebellion and resistance, the same actions, you know, the same like, we're going to do a demonstration, we're going to do a blockade, we're going to do a riot, we're going to do a strike, we're going to write a pamphlet, we're going to do an assembly, we're going to do a camp. Basically, the toolbox is a bit small. So for us, the idea is basically to bring artists and activists together using the creativity of the activists, of the artists, and the courage of the activists and create these forms. We do that within kind of pedagogic uh, workshops where we teach horizontal decision making and then start to design the direct action. Uh, what is pretty key is that these are always done within the context of uh, social movements, that we're entangled in social movements. Uh, we have one foot in the social movements and one foot in the cultural institutions and it's super important for us. And the social movements we've been entangled with range from uh, the climate camps, the summit mobilizations, uh, and we always also work as organizers within those uh, movements, not really making any difference between organizing and art. And so we did the book tour also during uh, COP26. This, that was the, the, the uh, happening at the same time, also because actually it was uh, a social movement to which we would we did quite a few experiments with the lab. Um, the first experiment we did around COP26, uh, we haven't, we're not going to talk about it in detail here, but just to give you a taste, it was called Put the Fun Between Your Legs, Become the Bike Block. And we basically recycled hundreds of, of old abandoned bikes in Copenhagen for the COP20, uh, COP20, COP15, uh, where some people still had a bit of hope in the COP back in Copenhagen. Uh, and we basically recycled these bikes and turned them into tools of disobedience. This was the Double Double Trouble. Uh, seeing as it wasn't, weren't, these weren't people's own bikes, uh, we created about 10 bike gangs with about 10 people in each, so about 150 people, and some of the bikes were then used as barricades to, pr to basically the whole project was to protect frontline communities um, who were doing a big assembly. Uh, many uh, folk from all over the world, frontline assemblies, tried to do an assembly and the police were uh, intent on attacking it, so the bike block protected it. The other COP that we worked on uh, was the COP21 in 2015 in Paris, uh, and this is where we first used this this title that then became the title of the book, We Are Nature Defending Itself, or at the time we didn't have the on the nature. Uh, so Paris, uh, what do artists normally do though? What do artists normally do around a COP, around something like the COP21 in Paris? Well, this is Olaf So Ellison and Minik Rosing, and they produced for that COP this project that was called Ice Watch. And basically they brought huge blocks of ice from the Arctic and asked the citizens of Paris to watch them melt on the streets. This for us is a classic piece of what in the book we call extractivist art. Now extractivism, I'm sure many of you here already know what it is, but it basically takes material from somewhere transforms it into something else that gives value somewhere else. And that value is always more important than the continuation of life of the communities from which it's, that wealth is extracted. And we feel a lot of artistic practice does exactly this, taking value from one place for something else, which is normally the artist's career, the art world, the art institutions, the very idea of art. Um, and 
this here is an extractive machine. It's the biggest extraction machine in Europe. Uh, it's working probably right now. It works 24 hours a day. Uh, it's in Germany and it takes uh, the brown coal underneath uh, communities. There are about 75 villages uh, that have been already destroyed by this machine for the coal. And so in this situation, uh, what do artists do? Well, you know, we're, we're told by the IPCC scientists of the UN, not normally known for their radical pamphlet writing, that we need, we've got 12 years, and they wrote this in 2018, that we have 12 years for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And for us at the lab, that means changing art. And the book talks very much about this. How do we change art within the capitalist scene? Um, for us, it's not okay and it's not enough that to be an artist right now and to feel deeply that there are 200 species that are forced to extinction every day by the economy and then make an installation about it. An installation that talks about, that reflects on. For us, this isn't enough. For us, art is not to show the world to people, but transform it together. So one of the chapters in the book is called 200 Years of Art and the World is Getting Worse. It's a nod to a beautiful book by James Hillman that's called 200 Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. And in that chapter, uh, we basically talk about uh, uh, what Larry Shinner, our, our historian, calls the invention of art. And he basically says, art is an invention, it's a concept, and it came out of the colonial white European metropolis around 1750. But what else came around, came around 1750 in Europe? Well, another invention, uh, basically steam engines, uh, the fossil fuel, fossil capital, uh, the machines that enabled fossil capitalism to grow. Basically, all this stuff was invented around the same time as the invention of art. And so in a sense, art and fossil capital have the same extractivist logic embedded into them. But this strange three letter word, this word art. Most of you probably know that for most of human history and for most peoples on the world today, they don't have a word for art in the way we as European Westerners have this idea of art. Um, it, uh, it, it comes from the Greek techne and the Latin ars. And the irony is that even the Greeks didn't have a bloody word for art. In fact, for them, it, it meant any human activity. This could involve be horse breaking, shoe making, verse writing, vase painting, governing, navigating. Any activity was seen as an art, not because it was done by artists, but because it was performed. And this is the, the key word. It was performed with grace. What is grace? Grace is an act of thinking with and thanking the world. It comes from the old French. It means thanks, as in grâce à, as in gratitude. And for us, what we call in the book an art of life should be an, an act, a gesture of thanking life for giving us life, an act of mutual reciprocity, an act that never separates ethics from aesthetics. And around 1750, in the white metropolis, as this idea, this invention of art evolves, uh, you have these separations, massive separations of the modern, separation between genius and skill, a separation between the beautiful and useful, between art and craft, between culture and nature, and in the end, between art and life. And without these very violent rifts, all the ideals and practices and institutions that make up the art system that many of us, of us might be part of, they would collapse without these violent rifts. And of course, this idea was pushed and it colonized our imagination, this invention of art. Uh, and ever since 1750, intellectuals, entrepreneurs, missionaries, armies and have spread this invention and turned it into an unchallengeable universal. As Ariela Aishi Azule says, from the beginning, art has been one of imperialism's preferred terrain. Imperial violence is not secondary to art, but constitutive of it. And so what did we, the Laboratory of Instruction and Imagination, do during the COP in Paris? We didn't put icebergs to melt, but we did this.
This is the mesh. It is everywhere. Some say it can't be defeated. But what if we cracked it open? Would we be nature, defending itself? Climate Games. The world's largest disobedient action-adventure game. In Paris, across cyberspace, and beyond. Your objective, to join the global movements, swarming to shift the game against profit, in favor of life. We are not fighting for nature. We are nature, defending itself. So basically, the Climate Games was a game inspired by a similar project, but on a very much smaller scale, uh, organised by Earth First in in the Netherlands. Um, and basically, we the idea was to mix on the street action and online um, uh, uh, mapping systems. And so basically, we worked for a whole year, uh, setting up hackathons where we brought together artists and activists and designers and hackers and gamers. And we did these hackathons in uh, cultural institutions, in museums, in theatre uh, festivals and so on, brought these people together and started to develop this idea. The key of it to it was an anonymous mapping system. Basically, the anonymous map was there, people would set up teams, they would then in their teams put what we called play zones onto the map. Now of course the play zones were uh, places, were targets uh, of fossil capital. Um, and then people would go and do actions in the play zones and put the results of their actions on the anonymous map. As it was a game, there were prizes. And after the actions were done, basically all the teams voted for different uh, prizes. There was the prizes for the funniest action, there was the prizes for the most clandestine, there was the prizes for the action that gave mutual aid to other groups and other teams. And what some of you probably know, three weeks before uh, the uh, Paris Climate Summit opened, there was the Bataclan terrorist attacks. Uh, and a state of emergency was put in place across France. Friends were put under house arrest and any demonstration, any action in the street was banned. You could only be in groups of two on the street. Um, we continued the games, nevertheless, saying the uh, emergency, true emergency was a climate emergency. And um, 100, about 120 teams took place and about 225 actions happened. One of the actions that won was this group here. They were from Brussels. Uh, they're called the EZLN, a nod to the Zapatistas, of course. Um, and they did this action called Operation Vivaldi. Basically, they went into a VW dealership, they brought a sound system with Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and they brought with them loads of seasons. They brought with them uh, leaves and twigs and so on, and then left them there, and then did a haka, 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 never, the, um, the, the, the choreography uh, with We Are Nature Defending Itself. Another team that won a prize was uh, Brandalism. Uh, they hacked six hundred bus stops in Paris over one night putting up posters uh, designed by artists about the f fossil capital. Uh, another group got into the summit um, and they basically had, uh, they got into the toilets, changed the toilet roll and had printed the IPCC report onto the toilet rolls, which kind of said it all. Uh, was a T1. Uh, he had a broken leg. 
um, and he um, went up the Eiffel Tower and hidden as a tourist and hidden in his crutches, he had an actual broken leg, he hid in his crutches the antennas for a pirate radio station and went up the Eiffel Tower and started a pirate uh, from the top of the Eiffel Tower. Another group actually blocked this machine that we showed earlier, the biggest extractivist machine in Germany. But this was all very well, but there was a problem. There was really a problem for us at the lab. We felt we had, since 2004, when we formed, we had done many experiments and had managed to merge art and activism in a successful way. But there was something missing, everyday life. Our big inspirations are the Western European avant-garde, Dada, Surrealism, Situationism, and they had this kind of holy trinity of art, politics, and everyday life. And for us, the everyday life seemed to be missing. We would go and do these events, we would go and do these summit mobilizations, we'd go and do these, these things at festivals and, 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 and so on, and then we'd come back. Uh, we'd come back home to London. And we would actually continue to reproduce capitalism in our everyday life. In this metropolis, which we felt so deeply is a space which is designed so that humans only relate to themselves, that they don't relate to more than human, any other species, just to themselves. They see themselves as the only makers of worlds. And it's the, the metropolis which is a reign of the artificial over everything, a place that commodifies every single relationship. And so we felt that we, by coming back again and again, there was a huge hole in our life. And so we went away for uh, seven months. Uh, we got sabbaticals from our work and did a tour around Europe, uh, looking at utopian communities in Europe, self-managed communities, um, ranging from squatted farms to occupied factories by their workers to free, lo free love communities. And out of that came a book and a film and came ultimately enormous amount of courage. Inspired by that trip, we were inspired to basically desert, desert the metropolis, desert London, desert our um, jobs and our flats, and basically come to Western France, to Brittany, which is not really France, it's colonized by France, colonized by France, rather. Uh, and we ended up here on this piece of land, uh, about an hour away from where we are now, about an hour away from the ZAD. We co-bought a this piece of land with um, a, a group to then set up a organic farm put a landless peasant on the land and uh, set up a school for our activism and um, ecology but there was still a problem we felt that the logic of the metropolis was still in our body minds we basically were still in what we call in the book uh, the hypermobility of capitalism. This idea that actually to have value, you should move. You have more value moving than actually getting to know somewhere. And so basically we kept going, being invited to conferences, being invited to shows and, and, and doing actions away from home. And basically, or even though we never took a, 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 a we never took a, a plane, we've been uh, taking trains because we work as climate justice activists, it doesn't make sense. So we've been taking trains around Europe all the time. We haven't left Europe since the founding of the lab in 2004. Um, and we, re but we still felt that hyper mobility logic. Basically, in the art world, in the cultural world, if you're a cultural worker, your CV is great if you can say, you know, you've had shows in Dubai, in Copenhagen, in, in Berlin, in, in Buenos Aires. But if you say, I've lived in the same village all my life and all my work is about the relationships between the humans and the more than humans in that relation, in that, uh, in that village, then your cultural career is completely fucked. And so, we were then given a big lesson. We were given a lesson by the living, a lesson that undid the logic of the metropolis that was still in our body minds despite having left it. And that lesson was given to us in Hamburg during we were invited for a, a big project, a big funding uh, to do this project for the Hamburg Summer Festival at the Camp Nagel, uh, organized by the Camp Nagel Cultural Center. And our project began with a 10-day training in art, 
activism and permaculture that we, we gave to precarious workers uh, and youth in, in Hamburg. And it, the idea was this, there was 10 day training and that training ended with a show. And the show began in a theater, uh, as we often do when we work in theater contexts. We love the stage. We love the fact we can use the lights and so on. But it doesn't last very long. And very quickly, we turn that stage into an assembly space, into a space for debate. And so that happened. And in Hamburg, the debate was, is it ethical or not to sabotage the banks that fund fossil fuel corporations is it ethical to sabotage them with ants? These are the probably the only species in the world that is named after their exterminator. They were named after Mr. Raspberry, who discovered them. Uh, he was a pest exterminator, and he discovered that these ants actually love to go into computers and basically cause short circuits. This is because they are uh, have multiple queens, they need to make nests everywhere, and actually the warmth and the size of computers is actually perfect for ants' nests, except they create the uh, short circuits. They've been known to sabotage uh, NASA and uh, parts of Houston Airport. So the audience decided that this was an ethical thing to do. We then left the theatre, dressed in our edible balaclavas and edible costumes, and went and uh, put the pheromones of the crazy raspberry ants into the banks around Hamburg. But there was a problem. We love mushrooms of every sort. We love them because they're the de decomposers of death. They're the connectors to everything. We love all kinds of mushrooms, not just magic mushrooms. And uh, we wanted for the show to turn the curtain, the theatre curtain, into a mushroom curtain. So we built our own mushroom curtain, working with an amazing artist, Catherine Ball. Um, and it was an eight by nine meter curtain that we had to hang in the theatre. And we wanted it to feel like flesh, to feel like a curtain of mushroom flesh. Uh, so we chose the colours uh, and we put the uh, mycelium into the, the straw. Uh, and for anyone who hasn't grown mushrooms before, what normally happens is you, for 10 days you don't see anything, you water it, you wait, and then they pin. They suddenly come out, little tiny mushrooms, and then three days later they go boom. Well, we lifted the curtain on the, on the stage, it took a whole day with theatre technicians, it was such a heavy object. They pinned, we were super happy, we were like, it's going to work, because the idea was that the audience were going to eat the mushrooms before they went to put the pheromones on in the banks. And then there was a heat wave. And the mushrooms were like, we're not coming out. We've got our cultural timetable. You have your not, uh, so we've got our natural timetable. You've got your cultural timetable and we're staying in here. It's way, way too hot. We're not coming out for your stupid theater show. And so we had a very moldy curtain. We went home back to the farm that we were setting up, which was still a ruin. And we were still living in, uh, in this tent at the time. And we were feeling pretty down. The whole project was a bit, uh, it was an experiment and we call everything an experiment because we want the right to fail. And this did fail in many ways. And we don't really like failing either, like anyone. But we got back to the tent and we opened the door of the tent, which had been left closed by some comrades who were staying in it whilst we were away. And what did we see but mushrooms? Mushrooms all over the top of the tent. And it was a lesson. It was a lesson to re-territorialize. It was a lesson from the fungi saying, you don't need to have to go around Europe to make your cultural projects. You can have mushrooms at home. You can become the territory. And so we went through another crisis. We left that community, which was set up by people who had been involved in the ZAD as well. Uh, and we went to the ZAD uh, and ended up here. And so this is where we've been living since uh, 2016 in this uh, squatted farmhouse called La Rolandière, which is bang in the middle of these 4,000 acres of land that were due for um, a new airport near, near Nantes. Um, it's, um, it's a landscape known as bockage, which is uh, typically made of these small fields with uh, many hedgerows around them. Um, and these were due to be concreted over this particular 
particular uh, bockage is uh, made partly of wetlands. There are nine springs here that are key to the watersheds and also uh, made of farmland. We are with our own anonymous um, cows. It's, um, it's a project that has been planned since 1963. It was due first to be um, a base for the Concorde and then um, aerial Rotterdam. And there were great plans for this, uh, for this massive uh, piece of infrastructure, which was um, immediately resisted uh, from the very uh, beginning in the 60s by local farmers who understood that uh, it makes no sense to destroy uh, nourishing land to build this kind of, uh, of uh, infrastructure that only leads to the desertification of, uh, of the countryside. It's also very important to have in mind that these are lands of um, resistance and struggle on this particular region in France was the, the territory that saw the, the birth and development of a movement called the paysan travailleur, the worker, the farmers workers that um, denounced the growing proletarization of, um, of farmers and were making links uh, with workers. For instance, uh, during the first um, factory occupation in May 68, which took place near Nantes, the, the farmers from around here built a network to be able to bring food to the to the occupying strikers. Um, it is also the region, Brittany is the only region in France that doesn't have nuclear power stations because all the projects were defeated by popular resistance. So it was not a good idea to, uh, to plan this, um, this airport on these great lands of resistance. The project um, followed the whims of markets and politicians and kind of went into uh, dormancy for quite a, a few years, but it got taken out of the cardboard boxes um, in the, the year 2000 when the government relaunched the project and the, the resistance uh, reactivated immediately, but expanded this time beyond just farmers and um, a lot of um, local residents joined and, and developed mostly um, legal uh, resistance through using uh, laws about endangered species, uh, laws to protect water, etc. The airport was obviously due to be a green airport. Um, and, uh, and one of the, one of the most um, interesting maybe uh, dimensions of this green airport was described in the in the brochure by the uh, by the architects they said that it would be there would be um, a vegetated roof uh, that would merge so well in the surrounding landscape that it would look like a, a side of the bookage that would rise up um, the bookage indeed did rise up but not quite in the way that they had expected in 2009, there was really a turning point in the um, in the struggle, where um, inspired by climate camps in the UK, some people uh, came back with the idea and organised a climate camp in the in on, on the on the site uh, in Notre Dame des Landes, uh, very very near where we're we're sitting right now. Um, and during this climate camp, there was a, an open letter that had been written the year before by local residents. Who had, who had grown a bit fed up with the lack of direct action uh, of the, the state of the struggle at the time, but most importantly had realized that the government was buying uh, land and, and farms to make way for the airport and therefore was emptying the, the territory. And, uh, and in their letter, they said to defend a territory, you need to inhabit it. And basically invited people to come and squat land and farms to be able to really uh, uh, give a new boost to the, to the resistance. And, that's, and at the end of the climate camp, when the tents and the marquees were packed up, um, a few dozen people um, answered to the uh, invitation and stayed. And this is really where the slogan uh, against the airport and its world came into life. What is interesting is that um, ZAD is actually um, a hack and it's the hack of a, of a planning term and ZAD is an acronym that means zone aménagement différé, a zone where the development is going to be 
um, happening later. And so that means that the territory is, uh, is earmarked and nothing much happens because it needs to be left for further development. Um, the irony is that on these 4,000 acres, one of the things that did not happen because it had been earmarked as a ZAD for the airport was what we call in French the remembrement, i.e. The, the destruction of hedgerows to make way for agri um, industrial agriculture. That didn't happen. Um, and when basically in 2009 uh, the, the, the ZAD, the, the climate camp uh, turned into the ZAD, it became the zone à défendre, no longer the zone à aménagement différé. And it was the, the beginnings of what would become uh, this world famous autonomous zones where people started to um, build um, huts and, uh, and tree houses, some that were more punk and uh, some more futuristic. There were uh, floating cabins on, on lakes, um, many that were entangled with the 222 kilometers of hedgerows that formed the, the blockage here. And what they also did was to actually make links with local farmers, not always uh, in very easy ways, it can't be said that it was um, that it was plain sailing, but making links to uh, to begin to farm um, and produce in the way of the airport. As you can imagine, that was not um, that was not seen in a very positive light by the by the government, who in um, in 2012 on the 16th of October 2012 launched um, a massive military operation to evict the squatters. Um, it was called Operation Caesar, which in the land of Asterix was also a um, rather uh, strategic mistake. Um, and basically when the when the cops, when the thousands of cops descended, they faced, they were faced with a resistance that was more diverse and more determined than anyone had expected. Um, and when they turned up, they basically didn't know whether they would be faced with uh, burning barricades or um, old age pensioners uh, singing peace songs to them. There was really um, quite full on conflict to more um, non violent uh, resistance to, uh, to tree house evictions. Mud was a great ally during that very wet winter. Um, there was very good slingshot actions. Um, and there was also the demonstration of one's vulnerability through uh, showing naked bodies to the lines of, of Robocops um, and all the way to some uh, good old Viking resistance. Despite that um, extraordinary resistance, uh, 12 farmhouse and collective uh, were were destroyed uh, within a matter of days. But something else happened in the blockage at that time, something that was very unexpected, and that is the coming together of different forces that were not supposed to, um, to come together. And that really came to light on the 17th of November 2012. There had been a call out that had been produced more than a year before that had said, um, if they evict will come back exactly a month later and rebuild what has been destroyed. And at the time, um, Jay and I were, were living um, an hour away, as he was explaining. Um, and when we saw that call out, we had been involved in the resistance against the evictions. And when we saw that call out, we thought, well, obviously, it's it's very important to um, to take part. It's that we, uh, we will go, but it's very likely that it will be it will be small. It's like everyone will be exhausted. The attention, most of the attention will be put on anti-repression. We'll build a symbolic cabin and um, and that'll be it. That's not quite what happened. The 40,000 people came and many of them were organized groups with pre-built cabins in tractors. Lots of cabins were built this weekend with an amazing energy. Lots of people say it was the most beautiful day of my life. It, we were sharing an intense moment, so unexpected. On this day, we really had the impression we would win against this awful project. Every morning at six o'clock, we were on the barricades, masked and ready to do I don't know what. Personally, for example, I didn't know how to resist, uh, but I was there. For many, many people, it was like that. They didn't came the first day, they didn't came the second day, they didn't came the third day. On the Friday morning at 6 o'clock, the police came. 
they destroyed the cabins we had built. They also began to stop the work in La Châtaigne, which is the village we had built for this demonstration. The cops tried to attack, not having understood that when you have 40,000 people who have built this together, they're gonna have even more uh, motivation to defend it. The tension really, really rose. For three days, there were loads of offensive grenades being used, flash balls and thousands of cartridge of tear gas. More than 100 people got injured, and then the government realized that they were about to kill someone, and the government had been in place for not long enough for them to take the risk of killing someone, so they withdrew. Pretty much since 2013, the cops haven't set foot on the zone. And this is a nod to the Zapatistas. Uh, it actually says, you are entering a free territory here, the people decide. Because basically for six years, it really became an extraordinary laboratory of, of commoning where um, cops didn't set foot, um, where institutional interventions um, did not uh, did not have their place and that gave rise to the most extraordinary flurry of uh, of creativity um, it was really a place where uh, it was possible to try to take one's um, everyday life into one's own hands um, at its peak there were 70 uh, squatted living collectives more than 400 people and an incredible diversity of activities from vegetable growing to cereal growing, uh, sheep and cows herding, uh, a blacksmith, forestry activity, uh, cheese making, a library, um, pirate radio, rap studios, several bakeries, you name it, um, it was there. And it was really um, there that um, we, we realized and we really experimented um, that uh, when you have to, uh, to organize your own uh, shared life, then you have to put it and you have to give it all your attention. And for us, that is what art is, is really paying attention. And, uh, and it was uh, on the ZAD that we truly experimented the development of a technique of life what Michel Foucault um, has called this art of living where he said couldn't everyone's life become a work of art why should the lamp or the house become an art object but not our life um, and when that becomes uh, possible the the violent separations of the modern that um, Jay uh, described earlier on start to dissolve and this is really what we've seen on on the zad that there is an attempt to break the rift between art and everyday life between resisting the world and building new ones um, between what is a home and what is a barricade between what is work and what is pleasure between what is life and what is activism and that actually can take the shape of radical camembert made from disobedient and squatting cows all that was made possible thanks to an extraordinary culture of resistance uh, that was deployed by the entire movement. And what, what we call culture of resistance is the fact that not everyone is able to put themselves on the front line, and uh, not able or not willing to put themselves on the front line. But people can apply their skills uh, to and their uh, capabilities to radical movements. And that was um, seen um, on the on within this movement in the most flamboyant way and so for instance um farmers encircled the the hamlet so what you see on the picture here is half of the hamlet that was built in one weekend during the demonstration of reoccupation in november 2012 and when the troops withdrew local farmers organized themselves um, so that they could take care of each other's farm um, and put their tractors um, around the, the hamlet, link the tractors together and put out a communique saying, if you attack again, you'll have to destroy our, our work tools. The farmers have been absolutely key to this, uh, to this movement. But it's not just them. 
It's also electricians that help uh, the squatters pirate electricity to occupy buildings. It's cooks that um, provided banquets for hundreds of people um, of the movement. It's doctors that healed those that had been hurt during the violent eviction attempts. It's lawyers that um, gave their services for free. It's local residents that opened their garage to store stuff uh, when people had been evicted. It's, uh, it's everyone doing basically what they can to maintain that uh, culture of resistance. And it is really one of the key reasons why we came. It's because what we had been looking for for so long, that is what we call the DNA of insurrection, um, which is the intertwining of the yes and the no, the creation and the resistance really what we found we found on the ZAD and it's really important for us to uh, to bear the necessity of this um, enmeshing of uh, of the yes and the no because however many community gardens we designed or we built or how many cooperative farms um, cooperative wind farms we set up if we don't actually stop and dismantle the burning of fossil fuel industries no, if we don't stop dismantle the, the the fossil fuel industries and the gross economy that supports uh, them, then our gardens are likely to be underwater and uh, and frankly in the middle of spreading deserts. Having clean energy becomes pretty useless. And we must learn from history. Is there actually the fallout from the sixties, the utopian alternative movements that split from revolutionary movement that split split from the resistance when the when the, the obsession was with building alternatives actually gave way to the World Wide Web and Silicon Valley and the surveillance capitalism uh, that has come out of it because there's this uh, desire to create communities of, um, of otherness because of that separation ended up working uh, with and for the very military industrial complex that they had been against decades earlier and that's because they're separated so it's really important to bear that in mind all the while uh, the French government obviously continued to say that they would come and bu build uh, the airport and so with every um, announcement the movement responded with extraordinary uh, determination and creativity uh, putting thousands of um, bodies and bikes. This is the occupation of the, la the, the large bridge that uh, links the ZAD to the city of Nantes, where 20,000 people, 1,000 bikes and 500 tractors occupied it for an entire day. A month later, 60,000 people came partying on the motorways that surrounds the ZAD and where the, the, the building of the airport would have started with the, the building of the access road. We also organized rituals that were disguised as demonstrations. And for instance, we, uh, we called for people to come with walking sticks and plant them in the soil of, the Notre, of Notre Dame des Landes, making the pledge that they would come and pick them up if there were attacks. 40,000 people came and 25,000 sticks were planted turning one of the hedgerows into the most fabulous porcupine. There were also acts of everyday magic, such as the building of a lighthouse that we can see from our window just now, and uh, exactly where they wanted to put the control tower of the airport. And so on the 17th of January 2018, after more than 40 years of resistance, the airport was cancelled uh, by the Prime Minister on live TV. And in the same breath, he also said that um, the illegals, i.e. all those who had come uh, to the invitation of uh, local residents, had to legalise themselves um, or be evicted or leave. Um, a delegation of the movement um, produced a totally legally sound uh, document that and said, well, to the government, if you sign this, you want us to be illegal, you sign this, we become legal and all is fine. Um, the answer to this proposal came on the 5th of April at um, 3.20 in the morning.
It was um it was an extraordinary I mean it was a, a mighty military operation um that involved um as you could see tanks helicopters thousands of cops um within a matter of three days um eleven thousand grenades um, concussion grenades and tear gas grenades had been thrown at people that were defending life on the blockage and um, and a third of the cabins of the Zad were were destroyed um for us it makes no um no doubt that basically um, the movement had to be punished. It had to be punished because because the government can deal with uh, people saying no, demonstrating, um, even launching into confrontation to say no. What they cannot deal with is an entire movement that for several years and on a territory so vast is able to demonstrate and say, you're useless, you are irrelevant. And so that was that was um, the the punishment for the Zad and the, for the for the scandal that it represented. Um, against the the violence of the eviction, uh, we kept uh, trying to rebuild again, and so this is a this is an infrastructure that was rebuilt um, within four days and carried by hand over several kilometers through um, uh, across fields to replace the community hall that had been uh, destroyed it was destroyed um, immediately and so the message was was pretty clear after four days um, the local uh, state representative um, declared a ceasefire and produced this simplified uh, form that basically said um, if you put um, your name, a single name with a single project and a plot of land associated with it and you sign it, you will be able, you will be able to stay. If you don't, you'll be evicted. Um, we had 10 days and, uh, and that basically uh, gave rise to the most fractious um, and deepest wounds that the, the movement um, probably had to, to face because for quite a lot of people um, this was absolutely intolerable uh, blackmail and dishonorable surrender. Uh, which for quite a lot of us was obviously um, also the case, but but the 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 violence of the pre of the previous uh, four days had convinced us that the government was prepared to go all the way, and for us it was absolutely impossible to let go of the links that had been made there links that had been made to the landscape, to other humans, to other more than humans, to the commons that we had been uh, building for, for years. And so um, we made a gamble, uh, a number of us um, made a gamble, um, hacked the form and said, OK, you, you want names, we'll give you names, but we're going to demonstrate to you what the commons are. And so it is not possible to respond with what uh, you want but we'll show you how under a name that is associated with a collective, um, there are various plots of land that are all intertwined, that are totally enmeshed, because this is how the commons um, work. Um, it was a, a very thick, very complex folder that was um, that was uh, handed in to the to the uh, state services, and so much so that they had to um, actually employ five people to be able to um, analyze them. And um, out of the seventy collectives that made up the the Z at the time, sixty three um, decided to take part in that gamble. Seven. Uh, refused and um, and basically their um, their homes were destroyed uh, within a few days. So the message was very clear: um, you either you either sign or you get destroyed. And so this is where we are uh, right now. Um, there is the the farmland has been uh, secured through leases. Everything else is still in negotiation. Uh, we're still squatters of all the the buildings. And we're still uh, negotiating to uh, to make them um, accept and put into law what building um, a life in common and building the commons uh, can be on a on a territory that is that is alive. And the book ends with a chapter uh, entitled "Life," uh, where we talk about an art of life. Uh, and things. This is a book launch. Uh, some people like people to their authors to read from books. We we hate doing that for book launches. We think that's kind of 
silly because people are going to buy the book anyway we hope um but uh people did want to have some kind of uh texture to the to the writing so we're just going to read a tiny i'm just going to read a tiny little bit uh of the last chapter on the bockage we have become the territory because it engulfs and nourishes our imaginations and our bodies we know when the frogs spawn and when the buckwheat is ready to mill. We sense when the potatoes will be harvested and celebrated with a French fries festival. We notice when it's been too dry and the ponds become lifeless. We care when the amphibians mate and the message on our phone reads, walk and drive carefully, it's the night of the fire salamanders. We're familiar with the weave of green lanes because we learned them whilst ambushing the police. By deserting the metropolis, we learned to pay attention and practice an art of life. But as our friend, the philosopher Isabel Stengers writes, the art of attention is not just giving ourselves to a things a priori defined as worthy of attention, but obliging us to quote, imagine, to consult, to consider consequences involving connections between what we are accustomed to considering as separate, end of quote. Countless people now hold the picture of the Zad in their imaginations, like one might carry the memory of a work of art, an image that reminds us that we can all shape our worlds otherwise. On the bockage, feelings and desire become form in the shape of a struggle that put life in common at its heart. To many, even though they would never term it thus. This land has become sacred because they sensed its wonder and risked and dedicated so much of themselves to ensure it never became an airport. Quote, nothing is made already sacred, end of quote, hermeticist and youth worker Orlando Bishop reminds us. Quote, it becomes sacred when we give our attention to it at a level that reveals what it holds as energy and information. End of quote. When land becomes sacred, the struggle becomes part of everyday life, magic. Thank you very much. Thank you. What an amazing presentation. Thank you both so much. I've, this is the third time I've got to see this presentation. Two times I got to see it in, in person when you were in the UK giving your, uh, on your book tour earlier this month. Um, and each time I can report that I and the whole audience were uh, enraptured by it and deeply, deeply moved and, and quite inspired. And I. Unfortunately, the Zoom, the Zoom technology doesn't allow uh, you to hear the applause and admiration from the audience, but I think I speak for all of, or many in, in the audience today by saying that uh, it's a really wonderful, important story, very well told with many vital lessons for us to learn uh, and that couldn't come at a more important time as we reckon with the uh, predictable yet terrifying failure of world's so-called leaders to actually address the terrible consequences of the climate crisis unleashed by capitalism. Um, I want to now invite our, um, our audience to chime in with questions. And uh, I just want to remind you all that uh, the event is being recorded. It's also being live streamed. It's also being transcribed by an artificial intelligence. Um, and so I just want to give you a couple of options in terms of how you pose your questions before I ask Tina to uh, start us off with a question or two. Um, if you wish to me to relay a question to Jay and Isa, uh, then please use the Q&A function. Uh, I will say, so-and-so has a question and I'll use whatever first name you uh, provided for us. If you don't wish to use your first name or you don't want me to mention your first name, that's fine, just write, anon or anonymous before your message and I'll make sure I don't reveal your who you are. 
If, however, you'd like to join us here uh, by voice in the Zoom room and pose your question uh, vocally, uh, unfortunately, we can't do video, but we can do voice. Uh, please raise your hand. There's a little raise hand icon, and I will call on you uh, and enable you to share in that way. Um, Tina, do you want to start us off with a couple of questions while our audience is thinking of theirs? And I do see that a few audience members already do have uh, questions and comments for me to share after that. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Isa and Jay. Um, I think it's such a beautiful prerogative of land back as sometimes I think in the Canadian context with so much territory, we think of land back as something that's external to where we are now and is some kind of like poetic past. Um, Jay, I just want to say the thing that you said about the ants was really fascinating about how the capacity to establish our own sovereignty in kind of foreign capitalist environments can wreak havoc. I think that's a really um, interesting point. Um, I think one thing I want to ask you about is even um, in the book you mentioned briefly um, having um, suffering from post-traumatic stress because of, um, I guess, the resistance from the state. Um, and I think what like, you keep mentioning over the years, like these things keep persisting and happening. And I think about PTSD is that there's no post when it keeps happening. So I'm wondering what kinds of things that you do that keep you attached to land, keep you attached to these relationships in, um, when thinking that these threats are always so very near to us and constant it seems mm -hmm. i can i can answer um, for myself um i think that one of the things that certainly keeps me going is the extraordinary texture of relationship that um that they are here the solidarity that we've seen and this the the feeling that is very difficult to describe um to have been part of something that is absolutely extraordinary and uh, and to it still happens to me very regularly that even people that really really infuriate me in some situations i just have to remember that you know i just have to look at the forest that is still there that is still standing that is you know i just look at the hedgerows and and look back at these people that you know however infuriating have been part of this struggle and and that all this is still standing thanks to what we've built together this is something that really really um helps um so i think that that's one part and one of the things that we've also um started doing uh with uh in collaboration with another art collective um is a is a collective called the 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 car the uh, cellule d'action rituelle the ritualistic action cell and we basically started to uh, organize and propose rituals um at key dates of the of the history of the struggle but also to celebrate and um the the passing of seasons and to really um, to, to, to find another way to uh, connect us to the land and to each other. Um, and this has been um, really, I find, a part of some sort of healing process. Yeah, maybe just to, to add a few things, not much to add to what Isa says, but I, I suppose um, the importance, I think, for me has been to also have a kind of uh, uh, what some people would describe as a spiritual practice uh, uh, that involves uh, meditation and rituals and, and, and magic and to to have that as a regular practice that is something I learned from ULEX which is an incredible educational space in the in Catalonia uh, which looks at questions of um, regenerative activism uh, and does a lot of work against burnout and what I learned very beautifully from there was was really also that you know I, I realized as an activist having a massive burnout uh, in 2017 that for 25 years I'd actually put my uh, political uh, desires in front of my uh, personal needs most of the time um, and so what what we learned really beautifully there was how you know how do you actually balance you, what your your needs are uh personal needs are with your political uh, action and desires um and we've been so inspired by that work that ulex has been doing for many years that we're going to try and translate that here on the zad 
uh, through an education project uh, and working with a group, uh, an amazing group here that's called Soin Soin, which means care, care, uh, which is doing, has spent a year doing a survey of everyone on the ZAD um, and looking at their needs for he uh, healing and health. Uh, one more question, you're talking about um, education in the communities, and I'm really curious about how um, the ZAD and its activities have an influence on the imaginations of the youth who are growing up in the regions and how that's kind of raising up a next generation of leaders. Um, and I guess from there, how that can extend outward. I think, um, I just think a lot about how um, youthful imaginations can be kind of bound by the limitations of state recognition. And I think, I'm just curious as to how you guys are defining that and how, sorry, rather defying that and how that's redefining futures of today's young people. Well, I think that what is extraordinary here is that you, it's basically 4,000 acres of, um, of open air. I was about to say school and it's exactly, exactly what it's not. It's not a school. It's just, it's just this absolutely gigantic um, learning environment all the time. And I think that what, what it, produces in a lot of young people that I think we see visiting is is an opening up to uh, the capacity to learn otherwise and to really learn through doing to learn horizontally um, to learn from each other and um, and to really have this um, sense not just on the theoretical uh, plan um, but really through experience of what it means to to intertwine the yes and the no to actually build in the face of uh, of risk and destruction and uh, and to really try to um, to balance out because i think that it's also in the yes and the no that it's easier to to balance out the 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 personal needs and the needs of the of the struggle so um, i think that this is one of the things that i can I, I can think of that is very impactful for the young people we see coming through the zone i think the other experience for a lot of young people especially if they spend a bit of time on the, on the zone is the cross-generational uh, nature of the struggle here i mean we at table sometimes have seven decades worth of life so everyone from i'm often the oldest uh, in my late 50s and right down to someone who is two years old. Um, and I think that is extremely rich uh, and quite rare in activist circles in Europe. Um, and I think the the other thing is is actually the manualness of the here that, 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 you know, actually very simple things. And most of the youth who visit are coming from urban settings, very screen based and just coming here and realizing that actually here's a load of people that do not spend their life on screens um and you know get involved in in in, in making things with their hands and, and 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 touching things and and growing things and and that is pretty pretty radical for a lot of young people and funny enough yesterday i took a uh, a young person who was quite uh, in quite a dark state 21 year old quite a dark state and i took her to get a lift to leave the zad and i took a lift happened to be from the nearest mcdonald's which is like 15 minutes away on <laughs> and as we got out of the car she was like oh my god i'm coming back to civilization not that we're ever outside of civilization but there's that experience of being in something that is different and that can be different and it's possible we don't have to have this monoculture machine i want to bring in here a question from uh, ben who writes uh, so much of land disputes are bound up in rival versions of space or rival visions, I should say. Plans, designs, maps are produced and resisted uh, of what relation people want to uh, have to the land or to impose upon the land. And Ben continues, what were your experiences in the ZAD of mapping as disobedience, of co-creating and reclaiming mapping as a strategy for people and community? and against the historic practices of carving up and enclosing the land for exploitation. I know you folks showed a, an image of a, a map that was created of the ZAD before, um, but it, yeah, I would also be really curious to, uh, to hear. Cartography um, and, and mapping has been a really, really important tool on, on the ZAD for, for many years. There was actually a cartography group 
um, that was set up. And interestingly, it really links to this notion of culture of resistance because uh, there was someone who was working for the city of Nantes um, who had access to uh, very, very specific um, uh, types of uh, software to be able to do really complex mapping and um, and she came with that um, access and taught people and, and there are quite a few architects here who are uh, like dissident architects that live on, on the ZAD and actually did a lot of uh, of using mapping and, and cartography as tools of uh, disobedience. So they were um, being able to actually see the various layers of, because one of the really fascinating things about um, apprehending a territory as commons is to reappropriate um, the the multiple um, layers of usage that uh, that land is about, and that was uh, really clearly uh, expressed through loads and loads of uh, of maps. It was also um, there were also really uh, extraordinary tools of defiance. Um, because they really helped us go to um, negotiate with the state with having, you know, the maps of all the owners, the maps of all the people that were renting, um, all the maps of the various farmers, and it's like, and and it really helped this notion that we knew this territory so much better than they did, and it it was really in in many many different ways, it was. It was an extraordinary um, tool of um, of resistance, also because in many circumstances um, we could actually reappropriate uh, the tools of domination. I think that Ben's question is really spot on because it's the very often the 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 mapping and the cartography is used against um, against resistance, and uh, and here it was it was really used um, against it. So, and one of the things that, for instance, in the in the welcome space that is at La Rolandière, there is a gigantic map in the in the space, and and it's it's a really useful tool also for people to get a sense of the the vastness of the the territory and seeing all those um, points with all the the cabins and the collectives and so so it's also very much a tool to um to get more of a, a sense and a texture of what the territory is like we even use mapping actually so during all the eviction threats we work with a cartography group because uh, we did a whole a big training where we trained a thousand people over eight weekends uh, to defend the land using um, a kind of um, orientation game uh, things and using the pirate radio station and 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 walkie talkies and and so on and teaching affinity group work and so on and we produced this special map which was called the Zad Atlas and it was made special size so it could go into your pocket uh, in and so it wouldn't get wet in the mud and the tear gas and so on. Uh, and basically, it was a, a, a very detailed map of the blockage in case of eviction. So it would show uh, places, it would also show key um, intersections uh, which would need to be blocked to stop the troops coming in, uh, i.e. where barricades could be built and so on. So that was a, another very useful bit of, of mapping. Uh, and it had the kind of, uh, the, you know, information about uh, legal staff and so on in it and the medical staff and so on in it. So that was a, also a different, uh, another special kind of more hands-on mapping for the territory defense. I believe Mark had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, so I uh, loved, uh, as Max also said, I loved hearing how the um, presentation changed uh, I went to the first uh, presentation um, uh, in Edinburgh, and I'm curious, uh, kind of two questions. Um, so as, as you mentioned, um, the book launch happened throughout the UK during the time of the, of the COP summit. I'm curious how you, um, how the presentation, if how the presentation changed in relationship to your growing, um, or to any apprehension of or any awareness of how people were feeling throughout the UK in relationship to the summit, if, if that entered it. And then also, second question, because as you pointed out in the talk, you guys in the past have organized 
Activism Central to the sites of um, climate-based summits. I'm curious how, uh, well, how you saw, thought about what it was to be working outside and beyond that space in this time. And then, um, yeah, if you had, had any thoughts about kind of that, the summit form of, uh, if you had any different, um, yeah, sense of sensibility about uh, summit-based protests and um, in that perspective that you had from the far outside. I mean, we we decided to do the thing during the COP basically to give people hope because we knew the COP would be a disaster uh, and it would it, it depress a lot of people uh, and a lot of people, you know, especially younger people who haven't been part of the summit processes uh, would be depressed and have the blues afterwards. So we were really hoping that this would work and it kind of did because there were, we'd go and give talks to people and they'd just come back from the COP and then we'd turn up in their town and we'd give the talk and they'd come out and go, wow, I feel inspired and hopeful again. So, you know, I mean, we are propagandists of, of, of hope and desire. That's our jobs. Um, and we don't think that, you know, summit mobilizations really do that. Uh, and they, you know, they did in the 90s. Uh, uh, we were involved um, in, uh, me specifically, in, in, in summit mobilization during the 90s, the ultra globalization movement. But there was a scale uh, of, of the action and a scale of conflictuality, which really meant we had the upper hand that, you know, we forced, you know, in the late 90s, in the, in the noughties, you know, most of the big, you know, global summits couldn't happen uh, in towns. They had to happen on mountains or on islands because the summit mobilizations were too big and too conflictual. That's no longer the case. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we don't think it's really worth doing much on the ground during the COP26, although, of course, it is very good for movements themselves to meet, and especially indigenous movements and frontline communities who are invisibilized normally. And it's one place where they can get visibility and networking. Uh, and so, you know, there is some sense of going up to the COP, uh, but more to do with movement building than actual action. And I also think that think that I, for instance, I personally made the decision to um, to not put a lot of energy in building mobilization like I had done in for the in in 2015 and in 2009. Um, but at the same time, I also believe that um, it should never be a question of choosing one strategy. I think that there needs always to be various strategies and strategies that are very localized that actually are combined with um, strategies that are um, more connected and and global it's like it, it seems to me that it should never be a question of either or so we need to do and all the time it's like we need to we need to move beyond these these binaries and these dichotomies and um, and I think that as as Jay explained I think that there is a lot of um, a lot of really good reasons to actually go and, and mobilize around the around the COP. This is definitely not where our energy um, was, and um, and I think that yes, if anything, in terms of you know how the how the presentation maybe uh, changed, it's not so much that it changed, but it really it was it was very nourishing to realize how much um, narratives of hopes and and, and victories are important and how we need to learn to do that. It's not just because the ZAD is a very um, obvious one, but it's like one, one of the things that we've discussed a lot with people during our presentations is how the left is actually pretty rubbish at acknowledging uh, victories, acknowledging our um, our successes. And it's not the big victory. It's that, no, we, we haven't brought down the whole fucking thing with us. It's like capitalism is still standing. And yet, it's it's absolutely necessary to keep vitality, um, to acknowledge when we actually make sure that um, these nefarious projects are so complicated to uh, to organize that they are actually abandoned, even if it's just halfway through. It's like what we heard when we were in the, in the UK was that the HS2 uh, speed. Um, train line would actually only be built um, on half of what had been 
Two third? It's more than that, anyway. Okay. Well, I, actually, a portion would not be built, and I'm absolutely convinced that it's it's in large part due also to resistance. And I think that it's really important to remember that uh, movements um, movements are not are, are not made of this long story of defeats, but there are also loads and loads of successes. We're heading into the last uh, seven or eight minutes of our event together here today, and I want to pass on a couple of related questions from Beverly Nadus, uh, whose name I mispronounced earlier, apologies for that. Um, Beverly asks, what is the process for becoming a community member of the ZAD for folks who get inspired to come to be part of this project? And relatedly, are there other projects of squatting on the land as resistance to extractive capitalism that you can name? And is there a network? of all of these projects that people can connect to. And Beverly also draws our attention to the phenomenal book that uh, was just uh, published, uh, co-written by, I, I know a good friend of Issa and, and Jay's, uh, David Graver and David Wengro, uh, The Dawn of Everything, which really gives a wonderful set of anthropological and archeological arguments for uh, the importance of commons and the commoning and many of the themes that are vivified in the ZAD. Uh, but yes, maybe just to, to turn to this question, if, if people are inspired, what, how do they connect? And is there a network of such move, uh, sort of communities and resistance? But it's, it's interesting because it's like, I think that people who are inspired are very much invited to come and spend time here. It's like it's, um, it's still less than before, but we, st we still have some people who, um, who turn up and, you know, turn up for the first time and say, oh, I've, I've seen the story of the Zad and absolutely want to live here. And, uh, and the advice is always the same. It's like, spend some time first and we'll see, you know, it's like, let's, let's actually experiment life together before, before um, deciding that this is what we want. It's really important. Uh, they are, um, they are processes um, that are partly informal and partly formal. We don't have yet very, very formal processes for people to be, um, to to come and um, live here, um, but they are, I mean, it's it's starting to be put in place, and it's very much about finding ways to integrate into uh, the the common the life in common and commons buildings. Um, uh, it's very often by integrating a collective and finding projects to uh, to get involved in and um, and if there are other there have been quite a lot of uh, land-based occupations and uh, that actually took the name Zad um, in okay. France and uh, and a few have actually also won it's like there is a center parks that was uh, supposed to um, to destroy I think it was 40 hectares of forest that was defeated and partly also through um, an occupation of the forest linked exactly like the ZAD to a movement that had loads of other um, tactics, including um, uh, legal uh, procedures and, and very malicious um, attacks. It's like, I'm not sure that there is a, a formal network, but certainly uh, the ZAD here really tries to be a, a point of connection. And so there are various events that are being organized very regularly for, for this kind of struggle to come and meet and exchange and uh, nourish each other. I don't know of a, of a formal network, but it's, it's a, here is certainly one of the nodes of the, of the network. I no, I think that's a no, node of a network is a nice way of ending this networked nodal presentation. <laughs> well, I think we have one more uh, question from, from Tina as we, as we head out. Tina? Actually, I was going to ask a question about um, the counter mapping, but I think we're kind of heading in a good direction here with networking. Um, so I will leave it there. Also, I just want to say, you mentioned in the book that the Z was in the dictionary now or something. Mm. <laughs> so that also speaks to the breadth or the reach of the ZAD and the network and the coming together. Yeah. And I guess um, the processing of all these different algorithms for life that come together with the ZAD. Anyway, thank you very much for today. No, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jay and Isa, for, for joining us and for this amazing presentation. 
Uh, I know that many of us are going to be sharing the video of this presentation with our comrades and colleagues and students and friends um, and encouraging them, of course, to uh, pick up the book, uh, which you can find more information about at um, vagabonds.xyz slash wandi. Uh, Mark is holding a, a beautiful copy of the book. Uh, it's a very lovely artifact, I must say, thanks to, uh, thanks to Pluto. Um, any final words, Mark? Isa, Jay, before we before we head out, more information about upcoming events and other things can be found on that same website I just mentioned. Thank you so much, Max, for all your work and Tina as well. Yeah, thank you for for all the patience because it was a long process and uh, and the incredible editing and uh, thank you for the great questions, Tina, and the beautiful beginning and um, yeah. Um, we're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna be in Berlin. If anyone's in Berlin, giving a book book launch in Berlin uh, on uh, the first of December at Hopscotch. Uh, look at our website labo.zone. There's the news feeds on that. Uh, that take you to Twitter and Facebook, where that kind of information is, and you can sign up to a mailing list of the labo.zone as well, which is occasional mails about events that we do. Wonderful. Well, we'll see everyone in the streets, in the forests, and on Zoom in the future. Uh, have a good night, a good afternoon, a good morning, wherever you are, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Good night and Thank good you. afternoon. Good night.